Um, welcome to the Sunday session. My name is Steve Judge. I'm the host of the Football Network World's weekly online discussions with football practitioners around the world. Um, as always, I'm uh, joined by two fantastic practitioners. I have uh, Ariana Criscioni from uh, as a goalkeeper at uh, PSG Women, and Chris Fenke is SNC coach. He's now gone private, formerly with AZ Agmar and, and uh, Ajax. Um, I'll give you a full introduce, introduction to Ariana and Chris in a moment. But first, I just want to share my screen and, and give you a little idea of uh, what we're going to be talking about today. So, the big subject matter, integrating mindfulness into coaching sessions and player routines. Um, to help you kind of filter your questions through to Ariana and Chris, um, sort of after we have got through the introductions and the presentations from, from Ariana and Chris, we'll uh, kind of looking a little bit more into their pathway into, into uh, mindfulness, um, how they got introduced to it, how they've kind of in, brought it into, integrated it into their uh, practices, how they use it, and that kind of delivery again is that how that integration into the sessions of work, what were the challenges of doing that, also either working individually in Ariana's case or Chris working with, with groups and sort of, yeah, a little bit deeper then into those challenges and, and benefits of using mindfulness in their sessions. So we can get into those uh, discussions a little bit deeper. Let me start introducing you probably to uh, Ariana and Chris and we'll start first in Paris with Ariana. How are you today? Hello, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Hi, everybody who's watching us. I'm in a very cold, rainy Paris at the moment. I can't believe we got cold weather again, but see la vie. It's not um, sounding like the city of romance today, then. It's, uh... No, not so much. Although, I don't, but in a weird way, I think like the gloomy Paris is quite beautiful. There, there's a look mm. to it in Paris that looks quite nice. Um, yeah, so here in Paris, I, I'm a player at Paris Saint-Germain. I'm one of our goalkeepers. And I also work on the business side and lead the women's sponsorship department in our marketing department. So I'm a full-time player and a part-time businesswoman, I guess we can say. Uh, Trying to you've got a, mindfulness to both of them and, and be present for everything that I need to do. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of balancing needing to go go on 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 there. I mean, in terms of your football pathway, then um, I think the sharp ones amongst. Our audience will notice that's not a very Parisian accent you have there. So uh, it seems quite a journey you've been on to uh, to arrive at PSG. Yeah, so I'm originally from the United States, which some of you will pick up. But recently, people say my accent, they're not sure where I'm from anymore. I've just got this mumble babble salad going on in my mouth. I don't know what's happening anymore. Um, but I've also played five years in Italy. Actually, in Holland, also was just speaking with Chris about that. Uh, Sweden, Norway, and a few times here in France, back and forth. So, yeah, I've I've had quite the journey and and this long, amazing career that I'm really happy to say has been amazing, but is also coming to an end very shortly. Oh, oh, wow, well, we'll get a, get in into a little bit of that, I guess, uh, in a moment when we get into our discussion. Um, We've sort of give a part introduction to our second guest there, Chris, over in Holland, uh, in, in Amsterdam. Yes, uh, not rainy, not rainy. This is a uh, way to comp like mostly Paris is the, the, the weather is better, better. But um, uh, no, it's not rainy over here. It's, uh, it was a beautiful morning. Um, I had a beautiful walk in the, in the center of, of Amsterdam. Um, so, yeah. Um, uh, currently, I'm um, I'm working uh, as a um, trainer, uh, coach uh, for uh, for professional athletes. I worked for uh, AZ Algmar for uh, for five years um, at Ajax as a, as an SNC coach, and um, I'm currently doing a lot of uh, mind integrating a lot of mindfulness as well. Um, that has to do with my own personal experiences uh, uh, beside the, uh, my professional uh, jobs. But um, I'm integrating that more and more. So I'm, uh, I'm getting more clients, customers, what I'm, what I'm doing breath work, meditations, uh, but also not only that part of mindfulness, but also um, the physical part, because, um, well, I'll, I'll explain later that, um, that it, it is a body-mind connection. It's not only like this this um 
how do you say this uh this this mindfulness and this ease to be try to be um uh very like airy airheaded is that is that the word maybe yeah maybe not ariana you should coach me on the english we we talked about this before but um okay airhead is not a nice term that you want no to but um <laughs> what is what is the term freeing freeing maybe that's it yeah well i'll come back to that um come back to that later i think that sounds yeah that sounds like a, a better phrase yeah airhead i think is yeah there's absolutely nothing going on there oh. um <laughs> so. So this is so I haven't uh, I haven't lived uh, long in uh, in um, in uh, in the states or uh, this I'm just like homegrown guy from Holland and uh, I will try to uh, to use some proper English words uh, this morning. Yeah, some more free freer freer thinking rather than uh, yeah, airheadedness. I think is what we're looking for. <laughs> this Excuse me. <laughs> um, yeah, I think yes. That's uh, I think there was a little coin toss which uh, only involved me uh, which saw me uh, decide to put Ariana in first so I will uh, hand over the screen to Ariana to give you a presentation on uh, her involvement with mindfulness. Perfect so hi everybody my presentation is quite small um, I, oh, oh my god how do I why can I not think right now how do I post it into bigger guys a few is it present yeah if you hit present up on the top right. right oh there we go thank you sorry sunday morning i'm still tired um great so my mindfulness practice has kind of changed over my extended career over a decade of playing professionally um i've always been aware of what mindfulness can do as most athletes i think we forget that most athletes actually do do mindfulness even if they don't realize it but everybody has the image of an athlete arriving to a game with headphones on, listening to a certain kind of music. Um, we usually assume mindfulness is more of that meditation, quiet state. I don't agree that this is necessarily mindfulness. I think it's something that brings you into a moment that you're able to get into your airheadedness, as Chris would like to say, but more so that you're just able to be in a state of mind where you're present and you're fully there. And sometimes this actually comes with rap music, hard rock music, um, getting your blood going. But for me, this is still mindfulness because you're preparing yourself and your mind for something that's about to happen to you. And I, I wrote this on purpose. This is my guided attempt at explaining to you mindfulness because this is what I believe mindfulness is. So for me personally, as I told you before, I'm a professional football player, but I also work on the business side. I'm also currently doing two professional classes, one with Harvard and one with FIFA and probably other thousand things that I can't think of to explain right now, but there's a lot going on. So my brain usually looks like this. Starts out going in the right direction and then it just goes in a thousand directions. My thoughts usually looks like this. Cool, colorful, but going everywhere, different lines, circles, scratches, doesn't matter. Um, I truly believe this is what's going on in my head at most times. These things are great. I don't think it's necessarily a negative thing. I've learned to embrace them and realize that's also where my creativity comes from and that's how I'm able to do multiple things. So I'm happy, but at times I need this guy to slow down and I need these colors to become one. So in order to do that, things that I help me, oh, sorry, I should have probably erased that, but we see that I did this quickly. Okay, things that I do, yoga. I try to stay present and not let my mind wander. Um, this doesn't always work. I do more active yoga. I've done, for those of you that don't know, there's multiple kinds of yoga. I've done slower, uh, Ashtanga is not so much, but yin yoga where you have to hold positions. Holding positions is not as physically straining on me. It's more mentally straining that I have to sit there and try not to let my mind water and stay in one position. So for me, yoga has been amazing. I also like yoga because you can do 15, 20 minute classes. You don't have to sit there for hours. I think a lot of people, especially athletes, assume that you have to do long extended yoga classes in order to get something from it. I disagree. Um, I try to mix up my yoga sessions and I really like following um, a class or a program. It allows me to zone out and just follow somebody else's words. Um, I do do breathing exercises. I try to do them first thing in the morning when I wake up before I get out of bed life doesn't always happen the way you want so it doesn't always work out that way but i would say more days out of not i do do these and i usually just do the wim hof me method which is 
the breathe in and breathe out really hard and, and kind of get your body accelerated. And I do it about 30 to 50 times, wait, hold my breath as long as possible. And I do three series of that. And it usually just gets me up and going and, and kind of helps me get to my day. Um, another thing I try to do, especially when it comes to football, is I try to simplify things. So for an example is for an actual match, I'll try to break down the match from 90 minutes. 90 minutes, uh, depending on how you look at it, doesn't seem like that big of amount of time. But when you're standing there playing a big team, it is a lot of time, especially as a goalkeeper when my mind races and, and I'm not always in the action. So I need to figure out how to keep my mind engaged. So one of the things I do is I either break the game up into five minute increments or I break it up to things that happen. So if a big play happens or if I touch the ball, then that's passed, my one increment's gone and I'm gonna focus on the next thing that's about to happen. Um, definitely the five minutes to 10 minutes increments also help because I can look up at the clock and know where I am in the game and how much time's left. And this helps me stay present in those moments. Um, I'm a big fan of quotes. So I found one to Buddha. The mind is everything what you think you become. I think the mind is also a muscle that we always forget about. We always think about the mind as something intangible where the mind is a muscle, just like our biceps or our quadriceps. And as athletes, we need to train our mind just as much as we need to train our body. Uh, this also comes into sleep, which is not what we're discussing at the moment exactly, but I think recovery is probably not just as important for your body and our muscles, but it's just as important for our mind. So putting away the electronics, trying to zone out and um, listening to music, but not always looking at a screen, getting enough sleep. All of these things are extremely important for our body. And I think it does relate to mindfulness. It also helps us to focus on what we wanna do. I'm also a big fan when I talked about simplifying or listening to music before the game. Um, I like to imagine uh, what's gonna happen in the game, I close my eyes and think of every moment that can happen during the game before it happens. So I can imagine how I will react to every situation. Um, it's also good luck. Your, everybody's mind is completely different. Uh, you need to learn how to engage your own mind and keep yourself present. You can try some of my tips. They might work for you, they might not. But listening to how people um, create things for themselves, I think is quite important. And another quote that I found, especially for my mind and my hamster running around, is embrace the mess in your heart, the wildfire in your soul, and the chaos in your mind. We all have different ways that we react and, and different parts of ourselves that we have to find. And you just need to figure out what works best for you. That's my presentation for mindfulness to start. Fantastic. Thanks, Ariana. Um, I Thank think you. Yeah, the, uh, a key point in there around uh, recovery, which I'm sure we'll get into there, that it is fully part of that mindful cycle there, certainly in certainly where performance is concerned as well. Um, and I'm sure Chris may even touch upon it himself in, in his presentation. Definitely, definitely. Thank you very much, Ariana. Should I... Um, uh, Continue with mine, Steve? What yes, is yes, yes. Shoot straight away. All right. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna start um, by explaining some theoretical uh, theoretical part about why I think that. Uh, mindfulness and also the the tips Ariana just gave us uh, are working and then I'm gonna uh, talk about um, how does that look in practice so I've been working for uh, the last eight years in uh, professional football as a coach so how did I integrate mindfulness as uh, um, as a coach and Ariana, you're completely, completely right about that. It is not about only quieting the mind. It is, uh, it's so much more than that. Um, so I agree with that. Um, okay. First, I want to talk um, about our state of energy. And um, I think that three components are very, very, very important. Uh, and that make our state of energy. 
Um, it's our focus, the language and our physiology. And if we work with those three, with those three aspects, well, we can change our energetic state. And that has uh, very much uh, something to do with mindfulness. Um, it's about like the empowering stories that we tell ourselves. That is the, lang the language we use every day, every moment of the day. Um, if you hear something about the, the mind is a muscle we can train, that is something that's a powerful line. That is something that encourages for us to do something, something positive. That is completely different than when someone says um, the mind, oh, we cannot do anything uh, about that. And um, um, uh, that doesn't encourage everyone. It doesn't do anything with our emotions. It's focus. Um, we got to focus on elevated emotions and uh, so the, um, the picture on the right side of the screen. Um, I got it from a book, uh, You Are the Placebo by Joe Dispenza. Um, elevated emotions that raise our state of energy. So um, the only thing is, the most difficult thing is that our mind is wired to focus on the negative things, the negative emotions, the negative thoughts. If we have 100 positive thoughts, what we do, what our mind is wired to do is that we focus on the one thing that is negative. So, and we, we hang on to that. But if we re rewire our brain and think about, hey, we got to focus on these um, uh, elevated emotions, that does, does something with our energetic state. And our physiology, so that's what we do with our body. How do we sit? How do we stand? If you, if you, it is very, it is as simple as this. If you walk through the park or through the city, have you seen, have you seen some birds this morning? Have you seen them? Or did you only look at the street? So if you look at the street, you are um, leaning over. That does directly something with your energetic state. Or do you stand up? Do you sit up? Do you look up? That has something to do with how you feel. So um, these three aspects, the language you use, the emotions we focus on, and how do we use our body determine our energetic state. Um, the quote here, it's about gratitude. Gratitude is the most, well, the, the most powerful um, uh, feeling and that raises our uh, energetic state. So um, where are we grateful for? I'm going to talk about uh, that a bit later, how I um, use that in, uh, in practice with, um, uh, with sports. The second thing, uh, the second thing um, theoretically where I want to touch upon is um, our brainwaves. And um, it has connect, it, it is directly connected to the emotions we feel. So if we are focusing on our anger and if we are, if we are feeling um, anxiety in our bodies, that is our survival mode. And um, if we feel in a, if we are in a survival mode, we are in the high beta brainwaves. This is, and these brainwaves, we, these are measured by MRI. So you can find many research and books about how to quiet the mind. Um, that was the word that I was looking for previously, how to quiet the mind. And um, these high beta waves, um, that's the, that's the survival mode. Those are also the anxiety feelings. We are very analytical. And we need to have these brain waves because when we are in a fight with, for example, a bear or a lion or whatever, we need to be, uh, we need to be there in those brain waves. We need to be, um, it's, it's fight, fight or freeze, uh, freeze. So we got to be able to do that. But if we are constantly in that amount of, uh, if we have constantly that amount of stress, that is definitely not healthy for our, our entire system. Um, so if we quiet our mind, if we start to have these feelings of gratitude, love, peace, we can drop with our uh, brain waves to alpha. And even when I do breathwork session, we can even drop down to theta waves. And theta waves, that's, the, that's the, the area where we don't even have our analytical thinking anymore. 
we don't have our ego with our stories about what we can or cannot do. So it's a beautiful place to get there. And we are, we, it's not that we only get there by uh, sitting down, closing our eyes for 20 minutes. There's so much more you can do to get there. Um, and why do we want to get there? Because if we are in the low beta zones, the alpha zones, we are so much more creative. We uh, feel so much more energy in our, in our bodies than, um, than when we are in this survival mode. Much more at peace. Okay, so here we go. The daily flow. I see mindfulness as a day uh, in practice in, in sports practice as a daily flow and it, it, it is like surfing a wave. So um, if you, I don't know if you, if you guys ever surf, but before you are standing on top of the wave, you got to work, you got, you got to work to get there. So you got to get onto your surfboard. You got to pedal out and make sure you are in the right position to ride a wave. I, th I think this is the same, um, the same thing applies to professional sports. First, athletes need to tune in. So when, they be, so that when they get to the club in the morning or uh, in the afternoon when they have a match late at night, but when you get to the club, you need players and athletes to tune in and um, they need to tune in with themselves in order to the tune up part is the moment uh, is the most important moment of the day. It's like the match moment or it is the training moment. Um, but first we got to tune in. So tune in. How do we do that? Well, we can tune in by, uh, as Ariana said, do some uh, breath work. Um, Wim Hof method is a method you can use, but you can also use a very, uh, uh, you, there are so many other methods you can use to uh, get in touch with your body to tune in to get out of your head and get into your body because when athletes are able to really feel what is going on in their body they can they know they know what they have to do in order to be ready for match or training so breath work gratitude as, as i touched upon before if if you have a group session in the morning um, with your players, and this is from a coach perspective. If you, if if we all sit down and uh, we have our morning talk, and we start by closing our eyes and just quieting um, our breath for about, let's say, just two three minutes, and then just the question, "Hey guys, look at us. We're we're here. We're in a professional sports environment. How many of you thought he would be here?" 10 years ago, look at us, we're here. How grateful are, are we that we are here? Can you feel that great? Can you feel that feeling of gratefulness? If that feeling is there, it already raises the energy of the players and not only the players of the whole room. So, um, and you will bring that energy uh, with you the rest of the day, as long as you, um, as you keep working on that. So gratitude, easy, but it's there. Active mobility flow. Ariana talked about yoga. I, I call it an active mobility flow. Most sportsmen, uh, athletes, football players, they're not fully aware that they are, that that is already mindfulness. So a yoga flow to increase the mobility, what we need to do for injury prevention, if we make that, um, if we are aware that we're also very mindful with our bodies at that moment, it is very good to tune in that day. Um, I always work from that part, from that moment to a performance activation part of the session. And this is all before we enter the, the, the pitch. Performance activation, get your body really ready. So in the first sheet, we saw that physiology has also something to do with a state of energy. Well, it is the mobility flow. We work with our bodies. It is the performance activation. We already get our bodies ready for optimal performance and also performance checks. Like, how is my body this morning? How is my mobility? How is my strength? How am I feeling? All those things can be tested and they need to be tested to know if some athletes are at risk for injury or not. 
if we need to um, if we need to change the training for that day. So um, it's really important to do those uh, performance checks before players enter the pitch. And this, I touched, I, I, I talked about surfing. This wave, the surfing wave, it is not only during the day. I'm going to talk about the tune in, tune up, and tune down during a day, but it's also a week flow. Like you have your match day, which is the tune up part. Then you have your tune down, your recovery, your recovery day. And the tuning in is like the two days before the match again. So this is, this is a constant cycle. Okay, tuning up. The moment, the peak moment of the day or the moment when everything needs to be aligned. How do we do this? Well, there are so many things you can do to get there, but I, my, um, the most important thing I wanna um, talk today is that if we focus on our language, what do we tell each other? What do we say? The focus of the emotions, emotions and our physiology. If we have those three and not only by the athletes, but also by the staff members, by everything and everyone that is incorporated with a sports team, that is a culture when, where uh, professional athletes can really shine, can really get to their optimal performance. And what exactly is needed for each individual, you can change that up because everyone needs something different. Um, and I like this photo a lot because this is the, the tune up, this is the match moment and um, all blacks against Australia rugby, but you see nothing like the it is a fully focused moment you can see the focus nothing else is going on he is not thinking about the past not thinking about the future it is he is completely in the moment and i think that is something we need to work for during the tune in moment of the day that during the match during the tune up part of the day athletes can experience this because that's where it's when it comes down to um, okay, the tuning down. Uh, I think here, um, as coaches, we can do a lot to uh, help our athletes. Um, it is about after the training or after the match, what do we do to really calm down again, to get ourselves at ease, to start to recover? What do we eat after training? Mindful foods. I'm not going to touch like... There's so many, I can tell a lot about what foods, I'm not gonna um, explain more about that now, but it needs to be really mindful. You need to really take care of your body. Um, you can also do another movement flow, not to get your body extra loaded, like loaded, like physically loaded, because you're already tired of the, of the training session. But like, as Ariana said, like a yin session or something, it is not about the poses. It is not about the stretching. It is about calming uh, your body and quieting your mind. Um, ice baths, for example, it is not about how cold. And we know that ice baths can help for our recovery, but it is also very a mental aspect to that, to that ice bath, to really get into this zone of quietness and calmness. Um, and Again, positive, expansive emotion and expansive are like the feeling the gratitude, feeling the love and the joy. Are you having joy during a day or is it all that serious? If you have no fun, you don't get these, these emotions rushing through your body. Um, we know that if people feel these expansive emotions, wound healing, for example, is increased by 40% compared to people that don't feel that. Um, we know that if we feel those emotions, that oxytocin has a very um, great is is is, very, is working in our bodies that that is secreted in our bodies does something with our immune system, does something with our recovery. So, how do we, if we know this, um, we know that it works also. I think also for recovery, um, how quick athletes can recover post-match or post-training. Um, we're always wanting to um, get our athletes 
recover quicker because they can perform better the next match. Well, I think this is a very, very important part of, um, of that. And the last things, last thing here now in the presentation, you hold the keys to which hormones and chemicals are secreted into your body. And that has to do something um, with our uh, energetic coherence. So with the um, emotions we feel and how we use our body and which language you, we use. So please be very mindful um, on that. Um, I think that, that it, that's it for now. And I hope we can uh, discuss more about this during the discussion, Steve. Yeah, absolutely, we will, Chris. Yeah, thanks a lot for that uh, presentation. That was uh, fantastic. Um, I think in the aims then with the discussion is to yeah, look a little bit deeper in, into where Ariana as, a, as an individual and then you yourself, Chris, um, as a coach working with groups have sort of come along this pathway and then how you're kind of integrating it into your, your processes, into your sessions as part of your your routine but I guess the, the best place to start with that Ariana is to sort of go back and kind of how your pathway into how you were introduced to mindfulness how that how that all began I um, think sort of mentioned in your presentation it's always some always has been something that you sort of believed in so I guess once you kind of got introduced into it in a in a real sense there wasn't a great deal of skepticism from you no, I think, I think mindfulness has to come down to the way it's presented to athletes. I think sometimes, again, for from the athlete perspective, um, for a lot of athletes, when you think mindfulness, it goes straight to meditation, straight to yoga, very slow things that most athletes don't want to do. Um, it, it took me a little while to get into yoga, and I do a faster pace strength type of yoga, so I'm still on that athlete version of it. Uh, but I think this is the difficult part that it comes down to with when we hear the word mindfulness. And I think it crosses over to what Chris was talking about language, where not only do we have to be positive to ourselves and the language we use in our own heads, but the way mindfulness is communicated to athletes is super important. And them understanding, um, breaking down Chris's for me too, it's a routine that you get into. And this goes to something that Arsene Wenger recently said in a discussion that I was a part of. Stress is from an uncertainty and a lack of control. And I think that the routines that we can do building up during and after our training sessions and our games can bring more certainty and control to the players if we have this set routine that we go into, whether it's ice bathing, ice bath, bath bathing. Um, before that, from certain stretches or certain moments, this gives the athletes more control about what's going to happen because during the game, uh, or during any sort of competition, there is no control. Once you go into that state of flow, you can't predict what's gonna happen. You don't really know. The ball can bounce either way. And so I think focusing on this mindfulness activity, which I think comes down to routine, really helps athletes kind of focus in. And so for me, I've always had routines. Um, some people call them superstitions. Some people get too wrapped up in them. But I think most athletes have had a superstition at one point in their life and don't realize that that is almost a mindfulness activity because when you're going through the actions of that superstition, you're focused on what's about to come and the activity. And so it is a type of mindfulness. And I definitely grew up with a lot of superstitions from a really young age of having to listen to the same playlist at the same moment, the way I packed my bag, the way I would put on my gloves and my shoes. Um, to now understanding that those were all mindfulness things of getting myself prepared and ready for the game. Well, those like those superstitions, though, were these kind of call them superstitions or triggers, but they were all around the match day. Did you ever have similar sort of processes that would get you in the kind of right frame of mind for training or? Um, I think training, again, those would come into routines that you don't really, they don't trigger in your mind that those are. Uh, routines or match day things but before a training no not necessarily um, looking back there were things now that I can think of I used to play football I trained far away from where I live so my dad would always drive me and we'd always sing songs or something in the car and that always relaxed me before I got to training and that's a really nice memory to have especially of my dad but 
uh, the older I get, yes, just what time I arrive at the field, how long, uh, if I get there late and I stress out trying to get dressed and then get on the field quickly, I don't like it. So I arrive much earlier, get into the locker room, change my clothes, chat and joke around with my teammates, then get into the training room to talk to our kines, which is physical therapists for other countries. Um, taking my time. I really like taking my time and just, I even drink a cup of coffee in our training room. I'm not going to lie. And then I go into our gym and roll out and do some stretches or some certain warm ups. Mine used to be very routine. I had to do the same thing at, the cert at a certain time. Now it's, it's changed a little and I just listen to what my body needs at that moment. For some of my other teammates that have a very specific routine to warm up before every training. So I do think those things are there. Um, for those watching, I do think it's really important. Um, I totally agree with most of what you said, Chris, but as a player, I'm going to just contradict a little because from a coaching perspective and you having to figure it out for a whole team, you have to have an overlying game plan. Whereas for an individual player and the way some coaches could help their players though too, is for certain players, if you approach them in a certain way of you have to do yoga or you have to ice bath. And if they don't like ice bathing, they're going to automatically block these ideas uh, of a routine that they probably should find, but they need, for a lot of players, they need to find the routine that works for them and the certain aspects that trigger in their mind because uh, for a lot of players, it will make them go blank and I don't like that. So I'm just not gonna do anything and go straight home. And that's, I think the worst thing that they can do. Yeah, I totally agree on that. And I think that is, um, uh, as a coach, you want this you want this framework, this, this, this base where um, it is also like um, you want to you want you want to have this base where where players can start from, and if this base is there, and uh, I loved it that you said like I, I start to feel what my body needs uh, at this at this point of your uh, career. Um, if you have this base, and then you start feeling like what do you need to do, and what is uh, what works for you. Then, um, then definitely it, it, is, it is an individual uh, um, thing. So no, not everybody, not every, ice baths don't work for everyone. You need to feel that it works for you. You need to believe in that. And I think it is, um, it is uh, you, you talked about the music, uh, uh, like every, uh, before the match, you have this specific song. Like it's such a strong anchor that you have in your body in your mind that if you hear this song you're already raising your energy because you know oh this is my song this is pre-match your whole body responds to that and it can be a hard rock song for you but for someone else it might be a very uh, slow deep house kind of vibe and i think that's the same with the um, the exercises we use to um, um as a coach you use for your players some, somebody needs a rock song and, and somebody else needs a slow deep house version and somebody else needs some some Spanish Spanish salsa like this is this is like you have this base and from there you you get these individual differences uh, Chris I actually have a question for you revolving around this from a coaching perspective as I come from it from a different angle how do you think you should come at it for example from a young age or here, let me take it back to my base is quite different because in the United States, we have a different uh, mentality when it comes to mindfulness. And even in university, we had a coach that believed in it quite heavily. And so we did stuff pregame as a team where at one point she gave us these like sticks where individually they could break. But when you put them together, they're a solid group. So we, we'd hold our sticks for a certain song that was the song of the season. And there'd be a moment, like a five minute period before each game where we'd have to listen to this very specific song and hold this stick that we'd painted and colored and whatever. And then you then you could put your headphones back on and go into your own moment. So it was a mindfulness together as a group and then an individual mindfulness, which was a pretty cool thing looking back onto it now compared to what I've had and played with other coaches. But for me, that was something that we had to do. And our coach at the time I was 18 and, and I'd had coaches earlier that had done stuff. So from your perspective, and especially here in Europe, how do you get players into that mindfulness routine that you discuss from an earlier age? Because if you start doing this at 22, they're going to be like, see ya. And some of them are, even if you write it, I, I watched some of my teammates, our prep will write it in our training room. They're supposed to do this, this, and this. You can see which players did all those things. You can see which players just left. So do you think from a young age, you need to be on them and like in the training room, making sure they're each doing it. And then when they hit a certain age, they can figure out their own routine or how does that work? Um, well, at, at AZ, I've been working with um, a 12 years old until 23s. So I, I've, I've trained um, uh, all these different ages. 
And um, if you start with these things at an earlier age, it is definitely easier um, to uh, so that uh, so that players can use this at a later age. But um, if you would start with someone uh, that came from a different club and didn't have this academy um, academy learnings, um, so 23, 24 year old, and the base that I was just describing is um, um, is not as like having a stick, like this is a child thing, but still like that you are like tuning out. If you tune out, like what the hell are we doing here? It's definitely not gonna work. So, um, but to come back, um, for example, I had a, a tr I was training an under 15 uh, boys group and how to integrate breathing exercises with that age group. Well, I'll, I'll, at the end of a strength and conditioning session, um, we all did our, uh, our schedules. They were laying on their uh, yoga mats. Okay, okay, guys, just lay down, grab a um, um, uh, like one one kilo uh, one kilo weight, put them on your belly, and just try to close your eyes and breathe it. But here is the thing: close your eyes, just breathe, and by your it's like belly breathing. You look like what what the hell am I doing? But it's like you feel that you can breathe in your belly. But then it was like a game because the one that is closing your his eyes and breathing throughout a full minute and exactly at one minute raises his hand that person wins the game so it became a game and everyone closed their eyes everyone was breathing doing this exercise and some were, were like raising their hands after 40 seconds 60 seconds one and a half minute but by the end, they were looking at me like, oh, feeling really calm. I was like, yeah, you're feeling really calm. And we play the game. That's it. So it needs to be fun. It needs to be integrated in a fun way um, to, um, uh, to get uh, uh, young players also uh, inspired and enthusiastic about this. Because a couple of weeks later, they were asking, I feel if, can, can we do this uh, breathing again? Because I feel that it helped me. I was like, yeah, of course. And not everyone has that, but some players do. So is that, is that an answer to your question? Yeah, I mean, yeah. So you're just saying you have to really start at a young age and try to get them engaged early. No, it, it can be both ways, but you can, st you can start at a young age, but you can also start when players are 25. Only it's easier when you start at the young age. It sounds as if it doesn't necessarily fit with your experiences of teams you've been been with, Ariana. I mean, I don't know if with you, with teammates, and you've tried to introduce it, or do you just very much? No, no, no. I don't try to introduce it. That's not my job. I have enough jobs with my yeah. club. Really... <laughs> that's something you discuss with other people and never say, no, have you ever tried this? Yeah, or... you know, my team has wanted me to maybe do some yoga with my teammates, and, and I've said no, 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 no. Um, I want to keep my relationship good with my teammates and yeah. trying to introduce something that they might not be paying attention or not listening or not actually following will not go over well with me. I'm very square, as some people say, so... I know my limitations in teaching them. That is not one of them. But then but there's been experiences where then coaches who've tried to introduce it into a group, even though you're right, you know, it was you and maybe there's some of the other players are doing it bits individually. But when it's been, like you say, introduced as a group and maybe introduced to a group as a, this is what we are doing. It's not like a choice that you'd find that there is some pushback on that or at least not not people buying into it straight away as you'd expect yeah i mean i think there's just there's a buy-in from the players you know that are going to buy in early so sometimes we do we have yoga classes and they bring in a, a full yoga teacher and, and she started by trying to do yoga with us um and that doesn't work you need to do athletes yoga like the athlete has to be in mind so for some yoga teachers who aren't used to doing this i feel like for her, she wanted to do a beginner yoga class with people who wanted to do yoga. Some of the girls don't want to be doing yoga. No. So you have to figure it out, um, which is where I try to come in and discuss, okay, if I was doing this class, what aspects would I use? Because I do do yoga and I do know my teammates. So they're not going to want to do that. They're not going to sit there for 10 minutes cross-legged because it's super uncomfortable for most of them to get their hips in that position and try to breathe. That's the worst way to get them buying in, making them uncomfortable from the start. Uh, so it is a, 
a difficult barrier that you have to try to overcome. And, and I think, again, it's just, it's super important to understand that the athletes are totally different. Some buy in for certain things and don't buy into other things. And for those people watching uh, from that perspective, I just think it's um, difficult to, to figure it out. I think, I think it's, um, it's uh, um, if you would like get a yoga teacher into the, uh, the, the, the gym of uh, Paris Saint-Germain, for example, that is already something like, as, as if you're going to do a trick, like, oh yeah, we're going to do yoga. This is, that's not, that's definitely not how it works. It's, um, I would even, uh, I would do a lot of um, exercises and parts of ro yoga routines. I think that's also something I hear you say, Ariana, like parts you feel that work for your body, that work for your mobility. Um, and um, for example, if you have, if you feel that your, um, that your mobility uh, grows by doing these kind of yoga poses uh, in the morning, um, as an athlete, you are like, hey, this is, this, is beneficial. this is beneficial for me, for my sport. It is not about becoming better, uh, becoming a better yogi. Hell no. It's about, it's about playing better football. And do we need mobility? Yeah, because it's, uh, if we have uh, enough mobility, it's also, um, it decreases our chances, chances for injury. So do we need to do that? Yes. We don't call it yoga. We, we call it a, a movement flow in the morning, for example, and we do the, the aspects that work for us, but not a full yoga class. That's not how it's gonna, gonna work. And then I, I think, and, and then you told about, and, and then it's like, not everybody buys in at the beginning, but it's like a step-by-step -step process. Like you have the ones that buy in from the, from the moment we start and by time, um, players get convinced get convinced that it works for them by which more and more are gonna buy in and feel like hey this is helping and this is so and then it becomes a base of the morning routine for example so it's it's and it's such an interesting process that step by step and introducing something get that buy-in yeah i love that as a coach this sometimes the struggle <laughs> Do you think, though, in ways, Ariana, it's um, sort of we've had past sessions around integrating mindfulness um, and the kind of practitioners in clubs who are introduce it into their clubs speak about it doesn't really work if you parachute someone in. So like you say, you brought someone from outside the club to do a kind of a yoga session and not someone who's part of the club and certainly rather than, than like Chris, who you're kind of almost bringing it in by stealth. We're not introducing it as a yoga exactly, session. Exactly, exactly. It's just part of our everyday session, but it's but it is a, a clear yoga move movement. Do you feel that because it was someone coming from the outside, there was already like a semi block there that she would have had to have been really amazing to do uh, it, rather than if it had been you know if you had your regular S and C coach introducing aspects that is a a more sort of a, a more a way that's going to sort of ease ease these kind of techniques in into a group no not necessarily because uh for example our prep will do stretching after practice where we have to get in a circle and then you'll have some like oh i just want to go home I, like practice is over um i think it's also i guess that's something really important to, to try to teach from a young age of players is that practice isn't over when the coach blows the whistle for off the field like that's not the end of practice practice is also the cooling down, the the getting to the kine. And I think this is a mentality that we really need to start changing. The practice isn't over just because you take your cleats off and you walk off the field. That's not the end of practice. Practice isn't an hour and 15 or two hours, whatever your training session is. It's that other stuff too. It's the before and the after that's your training. Um, I do like the idea of bringing an outsider in to do something that they're more equipped. So a true yoga session from a yoga teacher is much different than our prep doing uh, a stretching or even... Chris says his, his flow, unless you've been trained to do yoga, uh, those are different aspects. And I like the idea also too of the club, uh, from a player's perspective, it seems like the club is trying to give you more or, or brighten your, broaden your horizons to something different. And so I like this. I just think clubs need to do a better job of really preparing that outsider coming in of what they're coming into. And again, it comes back to language and communication that Chris discussed. It's really important to sit down for an hour and 
for the prep to create a session with the yoga, not just buy her an hour of class, bring her in and like send her to the wolves, which is basically what happened. Um, Cause she's going to get eaten by the players. <laughs> like they're not going to do it or some will be listening and the whole thing just blows up because others are being annoyed that phones are ringing or people are joking or laughing during the session. So it can be complicated, but I think it just, it has to come down to staff doing a really good job of explaining what's needed for this group of players, uh, what they want from it, how much meditation, how much meditation their players are going to do. Um, injuries, like certain body parts that don't, fo don't focus on sitting on their knees or putting their knees in a certain way, because most players are, it's going to be painful to a lot of them. And I think these things the overall idea is really great. The idea of bringing in yoga instructors to football teams or other sports, great idea, but you really need to communicate it and do a good job of what your players need. And, I, and um, to, um, I, I also think that if you, um, if players know, for example, like we've, um, we are testing a lot of things like the player, the readiness of the player in the morning. There are so many tests you can do to get a picture of if is your athlete ready, is your player ready uh, to do this, the training for that day. Um, and I think, uh, as I said in my presentation, if you uh, can um, have this, uh, this moment after breakfast, after breakfast, after practice, that, um, that really calms, calms your body down. So you really get into this recovery you really get into you get your body into a recovery mode. Um, it will really will benefit will be beneficial for all these tests in the morning. Like I can I can guarantee you will sleep better at, when your body is calmed down. And if you sleep better, well, the next morning you come to the club and you can uh, do all kinds of tests with your body. Is your body ready? Is your mind ready? Well, I think it will be better than when you not did that. So I think if players know what it. Um, what it brings them for their sports, the buy-in will already be, be will be better. Is there anything sort of go back to something that Ariana brought up with the kind of the tuning? Um, obviously, we've done a lot there when we're looking at the individual. But Ariana, you mentioned this kind of routine that you had when you were sort of eighteen with the team that sort of was looking to bring the whole group together. Um, is there a point where you think you can use mindfulness that can really create this kind of strong energy flow amongst the team, whether that be for a training session or ideally on a, on a match day and actually in the match itself? Absolutely. This, this particular coach really bought into to mindfulness and, and training our brains, not just our bodies. And the way she bought into it, she tried to get us to buy into it. And it was the kind of team bonding and activities and so we had somebody come in to try a psychologist to try to help us sleep so we did a, a training session of laying on the grass at training and and learning how to relax our whole bodies and this will help you the night before a game if you're nervous or something to go through this routine uh, and I used to do it all the time actually even now if I have a big game I'll do parts of it to to calm my down calm myself down and get me and I think she helped a lot of the players start to buy into this idea and it was also something that um, she was a very authoritative coach. So if she said it, we were going to do it and you weren't going to laugh or giggle when it was happening. Um, and that I think led to a lot of the players in that group continuing these ideas and, and this kind of um, session, but it also did bring us closer together as a team and, and as a club. And, and that was helpful to learn how to do things together, which we did pregame every game as a group. And then you also did it individually, your own things that you need. So I think that works well. And then as a coach, when you're having the sessions, it seems like, say, you have to take into consideration that yeah, there's going to be, you're, you're dealing with a group of individuals, but at some point, Chris, when you're kind of getting them to tune in, are you tune, wanting them to tune in as, as a group rather than individuals and be tuned in to each other? Uh, I don't really know if I get your question right, Steve. Um, it's about setting setting a setting a team of like vibe. Um, yeah, but more than a team vibe. I mean, there's one thing as Ariana sort of said, we're kind of getting a team bonding of such. But I'm sort of yeah, if you're looking at this mindfulness and we're kind of looking at this energy flow, that this energy flow is 
as a team that everyone is connected and everyone is kind of understanding where each other is at any given moment in terms of their energy flow and emotional sort of yeah certainly within a game when they're up and down and to the point where you kind of you can use little triggers to get each other kind of back focused whenever say you maybe if you've conceded a goal or someone's not you can see someone's wandering in training that they I think, as a group. I think it's um uh when um for example you always like it is easy well not, not i think ariana not you know well if you go to a match if you go to a match with a team everybody wants to perform and everybody knows okay it's match day this is this is the moment to shine so everybody brings a certain energy to uh, uh to that day to that moment but it is more difficult as a as a coach to get all your players in that same kind of energy for example um the uh, the morning prep or a strength and conditioning session because not our, not everybody be- believes or has the has the feeling or has the energy to that it will be very good for them and if you can get uh, for a certain training session, if you get an environment where all your players be- believe that it will be beneficial for them personally, but also for the whole team, because if Ariana gets better, gets physically better and mentally better, it will help the rest of the team. And if 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 these things, if you talk about these things, or the language we use with the team, um, and everybody starts to believe in this. You get already like this raised energy, this raised vibe in in a in, for a training session, and I always like the idea if if this language is used and we know this is uh, this is one aspect of the training. We are here to perform, to become better ourselves, and to help our teammates to perform. Because if I'm getting better, she or he's getting better too. And if then during a training something special happens and we celebrate that or there's always some um uh if you have a personal record during a, a strength and conditioning session personal record of for of anything and you can ring a bell and the whole team is like hell yeah look at her she got better and like we're this 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 does something with the whole vibe and the whole energy of the of the training so and um i think that is very very important to get this um to get that into a team and that will help not only during the strength and conditioning, it will help during the game, pre um, uh, prep uh, exercises. That will be something that that is a culture you build. And there are so many things you can do to build that culture, as long as we all know why are we here for and what we're what we're doing. Okay, I think that, well, Ariana has already given us one good, interesting example from her playing days uh, as an 18 year old uh, it'd be interesting to hear if she's sort of any other examples uh, of such things but uh, I'll let I'll let Chris sort of you're one nil down when it comes to these examples anyway so uh, I don't know if uh, you could play a bit of catch up there with Ariana the the the, the ringing the bell was was not it was not a full point Steve not quite no. not quite <laughs> I think um, I think we what what also um, well I want to I want to even out the score so I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna just gonna jump in here. Um, what also works and um, is uh, is visualization. You always hear it and it definitely works if you have um, uh, if you have if you can sit with your team and um, maybe you can start doing these things for a training session. And if this is integrated for a team, then um, players can do it themselves for uh, a match or uh, you can help as a, as a coach in this visualization for a match. But uh, you have so many examples that when teams do visualization exercises like, OK, guys, feel uh, just get in touch with yourselves, close your eyes. And can you see how we are going to win this game? Can you see how we are winning what feeling does it give you when we're gonna win this game um you get already excited you get your body already pumped up and can you see certain uh certain tactics um working perfectly can you see that and everybody is just within their own minds and sees it differently but um it will def it will it will work and it will will get this team vibe going and you get to the pitch and everybody has that 
um, has that same focus. So um, that's what I said with all these methods. You can, uh, if you uh, ring a bell, if you score a personal record during a gym session, or you have this visualization where you get the energy of the team coming together towards a match. There are so many things you can do. And it is from, um, that is the basis, what I talked about. This You can do this for the whole team. And then you have all these different individual methods that will definitely not work for the whole group. I think, yeah. Steve, I, I think if I, if I look at you, you're not still fully convinced. No, no, I am. But I'm going to, I'm going to, well, I'm going to use Ariana then as the, as the convincer. Um, but this is, but this is also something that you need to experience. And it also, it is also something that, um, that you need to experience uh, from person to person. I think that as Ariana told, it is different one yoga teacher is different from the other and uh, and the, the third one has something that will win the buy-in of the players and i think if you sometimes you hear something you're like ah no definitely not something for me but if you then start doing it and you feel what it does to your body and mind you are like oh okay yeah i was a bit skeptical but yeah it works for me and then it, then it has is something that can grow I was going to, going to use Ariana as my uh, convincer then and see whether through your career, whether those kind of visualization techniques, whether they'd been used at any point and how, how you thought they worked for, for the group and, and for you as an individual. I mean, I think, yes, everything Chris has said is totally true, but it always comes down to, and I think the really most important thing is players are individuals and in, amongst a group. Um, depending on what country you're in, what cultures, maybe in some ways for Chris, having a youth team is can be easier because normally culturally they're they're very much more similar than than a full professional team coming from different ages, different cultures, different socioeconomic groups. Um, yes, 12 year olds could come from different socioeconomic groups, but at least the base there is still pretty similar and also referencing what they understand is the same. My team, we have 11 nationalities ranging from 15 years old to 42, uh, bringing them together under one umbrella and trying to create something for all of them. One overreaching thing that will work for everybody is probably almost impossible. Or if somebody's figured that out, uh, they'll probably become a millionaire. Uh, so it really, I think you just need as many to buy in as you can and hopefully the balance goes in your favor of there's more than not. And I think too, especially as we all know, just from learning and from a leadership point, if you get the older players and your captains and those that influence the team to buy in, it's going to be easier to have a trickle down effect to the younger players. So it's definitely probably better to go in that direction. But yeah, visualization, I think always helps. And I think again, this is always something that's important to figure out what is the basis of your team? Where, what does your team, where does the heartbeat come from? Is that winning? Is that working together? Is it different ideas? And then building your visualization from there and continuing as a group and as a team and, and getting that buy-in. I have a question here for Chris uh, from Path Parasha. And asks you, Chris, um, do you coach your players on how to be more aware of judgmental thinking? Yeah. <laughs> yes. But um, uh, that is that is something that happens in. Uh, uh, I just I just had a, a walk with a with a player uh, two days ago, and. Um, uh, he was he was talking about other players, what they all were doing, what what they weren't doing good, like oh, and this player is doing this, and he is doing that, and very judgmental. I was like, hey, but just you can see this, but it's also some reflection of 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 yourself because you 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 feel that in yourself as well. And then he was like, yeah, well, well that insecurity, yeah, maybe, perhaps. It's like, well, let's keep the maybe and perhaps and think about it but just stay with stick with yourself and feel what you have to do and 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 the moment you are only judging and being ju judgmental about others there's a moment that you lose contact with yourself so 
Um, it is not about a full coaching session like, hey, I'm going to talk about judgmentals. And no, it's just like these little talks during a session uh, that are um, uh, that are yeah, that are helping with 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 these kinds of things. I think it would be very wrong to have this kind of classroom <laughs> classroom meeting about guys this is how we talk to each other no that's something that's need to be integrated in the culture and if all staff members and as ariana says like the captains the older uh, players in a team if 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 you are giving the same signals to players that will grow and that will build up your 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 performance culture um there's another one for chris before we i think we'll get into the uh, kind of match scenario with, with Ariana but yeah can you share more exercises like the one kilogram weight on the belly where you coach awareness of present moment anchors um and um uh, just to uh, just to get back on that one kilo it was like what one kilo on the belly why would you do that but the, the that's like a implicit implicit exercise by which you you can always start saying you got to breathe in your belly and then you start um, directing it from your head instead of just putting a, a little weight. It's not about the weight. It's, it's about that something's on your belly. It's, it can be as light as, as long as you feel it, that, uh, that it makes, um, that it is a signal that you breathe there instead of up here uh, in your throat. Um, uh, more exercises, but I think the, uh, also like the, the movement flow in the morning. If you have some certain sequence that you can start every morning with and, and players uh, know, and, um, know a certain short sequence where they have this stretching mobility exercises that, um, uh, that they, it's like a body scan that they can do and they know the sequence and they feel the sequence and they touch upon with their bodies. I think that is also mindfulness. Um, so that's what I said at the start of this uh, Sunday session. It is not only about all these exercises that we quiet our mind. It is also exercises that we use our bodies by which our energy starts flowing and by which we can feel what we need for that day. So um, no, not a specific, another specific uh, exercise. I think so far we've... Uh sort of touched on everything that goes on kind of in preparing for a game, a little bit of post game with the recovery, but how we're taking the mindfulness then onto the pitch. And a path question for Ariana, which touches on something you brought up in your, your presentation, we sort of asking, can you elaborate on how the five minute increments process works in your performance? Have you got a few examples of, of the increments? Yeah, so I said five, but I think I actually do 15 now that I'm thinking about it, but whatever, it could be seven, it could be 6.2, it can be however you want to break up the game in an organized routine fashion for yourself. So for me, the way I would do it, I do think I do more like 15. Um, I focus on, okay, zero to 15. So I keep looking, I look at the shot, uh, shot clock, I look at the, the game time, the whole game, and I can get, be frustrated if we play in a game where I can't see the time. So I just make it up. But for me, it's okay, zero to 15, I wanna go scoreless. I'm not gonna get scored on in this 15 minutes. Uh, I wanna play as many good balls to my defenders and I'll come up with three objectives or goals during that 15 minute period. Try to check them off mentally in my head. The 15 minute passes, cool. I'm one nothing in the game because I got my first 15 done. I go into the second 15, so 15 minutes to 30 minute mark try to either continue the same goals and recheck them off. Or if something happened in the first 15 that I didn't like, I dropped a cross or I just didn't come out the way I wanted. Okay, refocus on that. If there's another cross, I'm going to call it sooner or I'm going to correct something. So my mind is always thinking about what could be happening in the game and trying to analyze it and just staying focused and present. It's a way for me personally to have my mind always engaged in the game that's currently going on and to check it off if I think, okay, zero minutes, we've played four minutes and now there's 86 minutes plus recoup time on the clock. That's a long way to go for me to really stay engaged and focused. So when I break it up into increments, it helps me. It also helps if a mistake has been made because if I've gotten scored on, whether it's my fault or not, 
or if I did bumble a ball that almost got scored on and now I feel really stupid, once that 15 minute period is done, I get to restart the clock in my own brain from zero and that mistake is gone. I don't deal with it. I don't focus on it. I go to the next 15 minutes and then the next 15 minutes, then it's halftime. I can talk to a coach if I want to try to discuss what happened, restart from zero again, 15, 15, 15. When the 90 minutes is done, I can take a big breath. And then if I need to reevaluate what mistakes happened, what things went well, I can. But I really try to focus on those smaller increments in order to stay present during the whole game. I, I love it, be, what, you, what you were saying, because um, all the things you are focused, most of the things you are focusing on, they're all task oriented. They're all like on your task, what you need to do. It's not about 50 minutes. I want to win or uh, it's not about winning the game it's about getting the cross it's about uh, uh it's it's about your tasks which are always it's it's that's so good to do instead of the only focus is 50 minutes winning 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 or uh, you get what i'm saying right yeah no no i totally agree and i think it's yeah. important like as a team especially in football there's 11 of us on the field needing to do individually what we need to do so that together as a whole we can get that the, the whole objective is for us to win the game, but that's a whole team. Everybody has to participate. The only thing I can guarantee is a tie because the only thing I can do is not get scored on, which is a zero, zero game. Yes, in theory, if people want to get really technical, I could go up and score a header or a penalty kick or something, but the reality of the game- Yeah, come on, Ariana. My header. <laughs> not get scored on. That's the biggest thing and the way that I can contribute and give something to my team. So I need to focus on what I can do. And then individual players can do the same and if we all get our 15 minutes done every time, the ultimate goal and task will have been achieved. They will, they will eventually, eventually um, uh, flow out of flow. What, it will come out of that. Like if everybody does their tasks and focus on the tasks and the team tasks, um, it's not a guarantee that you're going to win, but it's, it's, you have a higher chance to. Yeah. Beautiful. Do you keep it very much like 15 minutes, 15 minutes, and you have these kind of very task oriented goals and that's it? Or do you, do you have a hierarchy that there is a, there is a 90 minute goal that you have, or do you keep it very much in these kind of very small? No, I try to keep her in the smaller minutes. And if I do get scored on, I, I usually restart my, my clock. Do it that way. Started on, if I get scored on it's seven minutes, depending if I'm doing a, and I think too, for me, it depends if it's five minutes or 15 minutes, depending on the, um, the, the opponent. So if it's a really intense game and I'm getting shots every couple minutes, maybe it really only is five minute increments because I need to breathe and, and make sure I get through these little spurts. If it's a longer game and there's not much happening, maybe I, I extend it to the 15 minutes. If I do get scored on or I do make a major mistake, I usually restart the clock internally um so that that's past it's zero and i can restart from zero okay the next 15 even if it's at seven minutes it doesn't have to even out to be the 15 15 in the 45 minute um time frame um but i need that reset in my brain to be like okay the goal is done i can't do anything about that but from now on it's going to be zero i'm not going to get scored on again i'm going to reinstitute my tasks i will sometimes too if i made a really big mistake i will come up with super easy tasks that I can check off, check off and make myself feel successful and that I've accomplished something in that next five or 10 minutes. Even if it's just give good communication that I can see successfully works, that my players get out of a sticky situation, um, make sure I call for a ball back and I can play it very simple, short ball correctly on the ground clean. Um, really simple things that I know I can be successful at to get myself back into the flow of the game and into the right direction and not like, what did I do? Why did I do that? I'm so stupid. And the negative talk that Chris kind of discussed in the beginning. This is, this is what I wanted to say. This is exactly in practice what were the, the positive emotions, the elevated emotions and the negative emotions. I love the way that you reset the clock after you got scored on because if you don't reset that clock, you might get in this emotion of guilt, shame. Um, you wanna uh, you you wanna do something that um, uh, erases because you are in guilt. You want to erase that uh, that fault or mistake, or even though it wasn't a mistake, mistake, but you're you're in a whole different um, state of emotion, state of energy. If you are working from that. Instead of what you do, you just stop it, reset the clock, and you go from all these 
positive things you can tick off, like a good pass. You're focusing on your task again. You it has that does so much to your body and your state, and also to your awareness and the way you can concentrate and focus during a game. So yeah, good. Thank you for the practical tips. So I do have to say the one thing along this level, especially if there's any other coaches coming in. From my personal experience, some of my teammates and the way we feel about things, it goes back to that stress of uncertainty and not being in control. We do play a game that's 90 minutes, maybe it's 96, maybe it's 94, but those extra time, you can kind of figure that out mentally. So for me in a training session, if my coach tells me training is hour 15, hour and 20, two hours, I don't care how long it is, but if that's what it is, I want them to stick with what they told us. I really dislike personally, if we're in a small sided game and it's four times five minutes, that it actually turns out to be four times seven. Because when I'm doing those increments and I've accomplished my goal and now I don't know what's gonna happen or I can't visualize the success, my success rate, it personally makes me go into a state of stress and uncertainty. And I'll have some coaches argue, well, you don't know what's gonna happen in a game and you don't know the time. I totally disagree with this because you don't know what's going to happen in the game, but you know that a football game is 90 minutes. And unless there's some crazy injury or a catastrophe, the timing that's going to happen is not that much. And we can still look up at the clock and we can figure out what's happening to, to minimize or maximize. If you're down one zero and there's five minutes less, you press because you know how long the game is. So from a personal player standpoint and coaches listening, please try to keep your time frames the way you said. It's not how hard or how long we go. We could go four hours if that's what we want to train, but just keep it that way. Don't, don't, sometimes coaches want like the, the flow is going well. So they think adding three, four minutes is a good idea. Personally, for me, it's not. So that's just- I'd like, to, uh, I'd like to get into this because this is, I'm the, I'm the guy that, um, that was monitoring training sessions live with the GPS, the heart rate monitors, et cetera. And then we have a specific um, specific um, uh, target for a certain training. And after these four blocks of the small sided game, if we if I was looking at the data of the training and I, and we could use another block or another two blocks for uh, to get our uh, uh, to get that goal to, to get our training goal. I was discussing with the with the with the head coach, and okay, I, if if I look at the data, and if we if we follow the, our, our 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 training plan, we should we should and we need uh, to add two more blocks. And uh, what I've learned now, what I've learned now, what you were saying again is that the moment we decide to add two more, it is not like uh, it is it well we need to get all the players, the, we get the buy-in of the players. It is not like after the fourth block, you are like a goalkeeper, you're like, training's done, and like the focus is out, and okay, that was it. It really needs time, needs some time to, okay, guys, uh, this is the plan. Do we buy into this plan? Is it okay to do this? And can we start focusing again? Can we uh, prep ourselves for another two blocks? If you don't do that, uh, I realize now, it's also... Um, uh, injuries are I think there's a higher chance of injuries because your focus is not there anymore you're like oh, holy shit another block I wasn't like so thank you I but, think, I, but I was I was the trainer that was adding blocks most of the most of the times I think if it's like a one block issue on occasion but I know that it's another five minutes it's not horrible but again I think this sounds bad but that's also your job to have figured out the training block and the heart rate and what it should be so you going into training had make having made a mistake is not your player's fault they shouldn't be I don't like the word punished because training more isn't necessarily a punished but um, extending their mental capacity at that moment for what they thought was going to happen that's not their fault that you guys no. didn't calculate it and so I think um, and I think sometimes that happens a lot where coaches they didn't see what they wanted or they didn't get out and there's actually a great coach, uh, John Wooden from the United States. He was a basketball coach. He's actually passed away. I'm not sure how much reading you've done on him, but he's got like the pyramid of success and he has a lot of interesting ideas. I don't agree with all of them, but there's some stuff that I really do like that he said. Um, and he talks about really getting in and getting out in a certain time frame of your players. And if the players don't give you what you were looking for, it might not have been the player's fault. It might've been actually the coaching staff that didn't communicate to them or, create a training session to get the result. And sometimes the players are punished for something that wasn't their fault. It was actually 
the training staff. And so I give a lot of respect to the training staff who can be like, this was our fault. We should have done a better training. It's not necessarily the players not giving a hundred percent that gave you the result of that. You didn't get their heart rates up high enough or something to that effect. And I think all of those things need to be taken into account more and not always just put on the shoulders of the players. Good point. The, the only thing I wanted to add is like, yeah, sometimes it, it, it is like a day to day uh, uh, difference, like what, what is happening on the pitch. So you can't always account for that, but still, I think you're right that um, uh, um, it, 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 it has a lot to do with, the how the coaches how the trainers are um planning that the training session um it needs to be done with a lot of care and if you do that really good it doesn't happen a lot that you have to add another 50 minutes or that you have to add another couple blocks during small sided games because you know most of the times what's gonna happen and um uh, if that doesn't happen you're completely true sometimes it's just the energy of the of the day and the team and it doesn't help to push more or start to yell more for example hey you didn't do this and no it's just yeah so yeah good point um with the increments um ariana then um obviously that clearly helps you to to be kind of in, in the moment in the game, um, obviously being a goalkeeper, I think you agreed with me, it's fair to describe it as being kind of that position that's kind of detached from, from the flow of the game. So you really have to work to be in there. Does, does it then have the feed on that if you're only breaking it down into these 15 minutes, does it, does it enable you to make it, as you found over time, has it made it easier for you to kind of, as, um, as Chris called it, tune, tune down? Just age your recovery. You're able to come down a little bit quicker and, and move on in your head. And you can then relax and start looking, you know, or do you still find that the act of being part of a physical performance is always going to take a number of hours before you can properly start to come down and and chill out and recover? It took me a second to figure out where this question was going. Okay. Um, no, I don't think the recovery has anything to do with that was still 90 minutes and your brain was still going in a thousand directions, even if you broke it down. Uh, the increment is more to be present in those minutes, not for what happens after. Um, also, too, for me, it depends on how strenuous the game was physically and or mentally, because I've been in a lot of games that I actually don't get very many touches, but it's against a really big team. So I have to be present because at any moment they could break the line and it's going to be a one save one moment to change the whole game. Um, and those can be much more tiring actually. And I can be more tired after a game that I didn't do very much physically, but I had to really stay engaged mentally versus I had to do a lot physically. And, you know, I just needed to kind of lay down for an hour after and recuperate. Um, my mind needs more recuperation than my body. So I don't think the increments really make that big of a difference from a recuperation post game. It's more just being present. That kind of fits in with what you're saying that there's that, that mental stress is uh, is what we're, we're what you're working on here with the mindfulness, Chris. Um, what is what is your what is your? What There's is not your a specific question. question there, Chris. It's very open for you to go and lead on from what Ariana said. <laughs> that, that for her, it wasn't so much the, the the physical side of the game that can be exhausting. It is that that mental side that sort mm. of level of focus, concentration for 90 minutes, the stress of knowing that, yeah, you're going to be called upon for one moment yeah. and you have to perform. Yeah, I think, I think this is, um, uh, um, you, can, you can see this in this uh, fight, fight or freeze mode. It's like, this is like all your, uh, these kind of hormones and chemicals are racing through your body. You are like on a 100% alert mode and um, it is to be healthy, to be not only mentally, but also like it, all these thoughts and, all the, and this, 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 this um, alert moment uh, status uh, that, ha that, sec that secretes a lot of hormones and chemicals in our body, which are good for that moment. Um, it is all with, um, but it is very healthy for us if we quiet our mind and if we calm down, if we tune down, 
so that our body can recover. But because if we have these hormones and chemicals too long in our system, which is not only during the game, but also uh, post game or the next day, we are still worried. It, it, it is also worrying about the loss. And yes, most uh, if you lost the game the next morning, uh, you still talk about that loss. But as Ariana said, if you don't have that moment when you stop the time and you start looking uh, for the next 15 minutes or for the next game, you keep in that worrying mode and you also keep those kind of hormones and chemicals in your body. So to be healthy and to start really recover is that you need to stop the time, need to get a different focus, um, quiet your mind, quiet your body, get into uh, a, a relaxed state. Otherwise, you won't, you won't, uh, you won't recover good as well. So um, I love the, uh, the, the stopping time. Okay, happened, we stop and we continue and look forward. And that's also after a game, as quick as possible. I mean, how, do you, how do you feel that, Ariana? Like after a game? I disagree that it has to be as quick as possible. I do think you, each player has to decompress in a different way. And I don't think you can get over, like I've made some really bad mistakes. There's no way that I can get over it in 10 seconds. And I think it would be wrong to tell me to. I think it's not necessarily comparing it to a loss of a loved one, but you have to deal with it. You can't just try to compartmentalize it and put it in a certain area. I agree. It's like as quick as possible because like it needs time as well to mourn. Mourn is a w mourn is the word. Yeah. yeah. To mourn about a, a big mistake takes longer than exactly, but as quick as possible, as quick as can be. Yeah. So I think, I think players have to, as coaches, I think we need to give players more of the opportunity to, to decompress about that situation. But yes, like you're saying the quick as possible, I think we just need to come up with a better term because quick as possible kind of sounds like something like get over it as quick as possible. Let your fingers and go, no. Or it's also just not something that you need to think about, like whatever. No, I mean, you need to analyze it, but you don't need to overanalyze it. There's only so many times you can watch yourself make a huge mistake. You know what you did wrong, kind of don't. And it's not as simple as just don't do it again. That doesn't work. That would be easy if people wanted to quit bad habits like drinking or smoking or, or things like that stop drinking <laughs> cool. i mean if you've noticed too i i bite my nails love to quit wanted to quit for 20 years haven't done it yet it's not as simple as just stop love to cold turkey doesn't work um so i think we just need to give the players the time i think coaches could help by maybe watching a little video or just maybe having a, a five minute discussion about if a big mistake would happen or I think it's not just a mistake from a goalkeeper, but like getting carded, getting a red card, which will change the whole trajectory of a game for the rest of your players, especially if you did something really stupid that just wasn't necessary. Uh, you just put everybody else in a really terrible position and that, and that can be quite strenuous and stressful on a player. So I think the players need to know what they did wrong, where they can improve. I also think just, just like, Screaming at yourself, that language you talked about, you can scream at yourself and I do and I need to, but I also need to figure out, okay, how can I correct it? Where can I go from here? What training things can I do? Again, for me, it's really important to be able to look to something incremental, incremental improvements. Yeah, I made that mistake, but I won't make it again because I'm going to do A, B, and C is also really helpful for players. That also goes into a type of routine or something to improve something. So also from a coaching perspective, if a huge mistake was made, maybe your training the next day needs to be adapted to help that player work on the long ball. The goalkeeper dropped a cross. Maybe they need to work on crosses that week rather than the training that you had scheduled for fitness or whatever that may be. Mm. Um, so the adaptability and quickly is quite important. And I think will actually help the players rebuild their confidence in that area and then be ready for the next match. I think the breaking it down also too goes into a, uh, pre-game game like recovery mentally and physically but recovery mentally also deals with what I did right what I did wrong and even if you did something amazing you only get to cheer about it for so long because there's a new game and it's been forgotten um and then you have to break that incremental 15 minute period away and now it's prep for the new game play the new game decompress and this cycle all over again yeah um if you uh for example I, th I think up just to clarify if, if I got it right, um, the, the as quick as possible, like the it possible is like, sometimes you've got more time to, to think about that or a lost game than, uh, than, the, than, than something else that happened. But um, if the next day, if you, if you dropped a cross, for example, 
and the next day you're still in this, um, how do you say that, decompression, decompression mode, yeah? Um, if you're still in that, in that vibe and you're gonna practice crossings, it's not gonna work. Because no, you first, no, you, you might need two or three days like that. Exactly, you first need to like you first need to be able to really stop that clock, start over, and if you are at that moment, you can start uh, building trust again by putting that into a practice. So it's 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 a lot of like right timing of uh, exercises and uh, coaching as well. Yeah. You found Ariana, and we talk about that decompression mode. Or it seems like in football. Um, the review of a game happens 24 hours, 48 hours later. Although occasionally emotions will overspill in the dressing room and it will all come out there. When those emotions come out in the dressing room and it's all played out in the moment and everyone's live feelings are coming out, is there an advantage in that in terms of enabling you to move on? Or is it easier oh, to do it in a controlled manner over, over the 48 hours where everyone can come back and talk about it in a kind of less emotional state? I mean, I don't think that ever actually happens that you can hold it for 48 hours to then discuss it. It might be that's when like the coach brings the whole team together. and you. Yeah, put yeah. The I'm sure you as an individual are having those conversations, but as a team, as a group, yeah, um, it doesn't happen. I mean, for very rarely especially if it's a negative thing, will you stay in the locker room right after a game? I think that could create possible violence <laughs> amongst each other, or I don't think that would be the best. It's when any high intensity situation happens that people need to take a breath and kind of deal with it personally before you can deal with it as a group. I would say probably most players deal with it in small groups because you would go to your friendship group or those that you feel more confident with. And there's definitely a part, a conversation or just sitting in the locker room, the person to your left or right where you sit, you'll probably discuss with them whatever happened. Um, so I think that happens, but no, rarely I think does like the coach walk in, lock the door and be like, cool, we're not leaving until we sort this out. Also too, because from a coaching perspective, I don't think you can decompress or actually understand what really happened in the game 30 seconds after the whistle blows. I think everybody needs a moment to rewatch the game or to reflect about what happened before you can do it as a team. Um, I don't know your thoughts on that. Chris, I only bring it up as a um, session we had, um, although it was a discussion after the session with a uh, guy who used to be with the elite forces in the UK. And he brought it up that he didn't understand why football doesn't do that because that's exactly what they would do in the elite forces. As soon as they finished the mission, they would have that conversation there and then when emotions would be heightened because you know people could have died on that mission. So it's not just losing a game of football. So he would say that, yeah, those are very heightened emotions that you could be dealing with, but it's always good to get that completely out of the way and move on. And that was their way of doing it. So. I don't know whether you've thought your thoughts on that, that Chris, or you very much that, okay, everyone needs to have their own thoughts and then come together. Well, I think that um, I've, I think it's a very good when these emotions come up because you can see during a, during a season when, um, when players don't um, express their emotions or express their, their feelings or their thoughts, it's just going to build up. It's going to build up and build up for that one moment that it snaps or whatever. So I think it's very healthy to have these um, uh, emotions come out and if, if like shout to each other or uh, um, uh, it, it needs, it's, it's real. So, uh, and a real emotions, uh, th there's, those are good to express and, and those are also good to, um, to have a meeting after that. Like what, why were you, why were you so angry or why did you feel that? Um, but I agree with Ariana that it's uh, directly after the match. That's definitely not the. I wouldn't. I wouldn't go for that moment to uh, to get into a group council. No, and um, uh, it would be uh, it would be good to uh, to to focus on your on your on yourself and get yourself open again. Because most of the times, if you are in those states, you're also not not open to uh, to discuss it in an in yeah with an. And, and come to good solutions. So um, 
I would agree with Ariana. I think so. It's quite different, though, what you were saying, Steve, about from a, a military standpoint and what those guys go through on a mission. Um, it's completely different in a life and death situation, the life and death of other people that you're trying to save versus we, we talk about sport being life and death. And, and in some ways it is from political, sociopolitical standpoint. But um, in reality, the game that I play in tomorrow, the result is not going to be life or death for me or my teammates in one way, but in another way too, when you're in the military, you can't just leave, you can't walk out of that room and not solve it. Where in football, if it goes wrong or the coaching staff doesn't do it right, that player can transfer. Um, the player could not play the next game. Uh, more things can happen. And I think it's just a different, you can't put those two on the same level by any means. Cause also too, what you're discussing is not the same. And I just think there's different outcomes that need to be relaxed. Um, and there's a different training. Those the guys and women going into battle in those military situations, especially when they're um, special forces, they've been trained in mental warfare and different mental, they've bought in in a different way that players haven't bought into. And so I don't think you can compare them. Good point. Was, yeah, I think yeah, his point was that he was still very much involved at a moment of that required a, a level of, certainly from the head coach, emotional intelligence. So I think that was... That was just something that he threw out there, that that was something that they did. I mean, I think it'd be great if we could get all our coaches more emotional intelligence and have them train <laughs> like, full warfare like they do in the military. I definitely think some coaching staff could use a lot more mental training and dealing with a group and, and how, to, how to deal with a group and the different personalities that come into it that definitely from a special forces, from a lot of countries, those, those men and women are trained and have been millions of dollars have been put into their training in order for them to arrive and, and get to that success. So I don't think we're comparing apples to apples here. But I, but I think that, um, I think that all these different players in a football team, I think that uh, uh, if, uh, if a coach can, uh, can get in touch with like, with a, a feeling or um, um, feeling what different players can, can feel or can see or can sense what they, uh, what they need at that moment that also means that not everybody is ready to discuss a game in the locker room at that moment so as a coach you need to know all right with these two or three i can get into a discussion right right away because that is also what they would like and these others they would have they would sleep over and they need another day and they would etc so um uh I think that um, uh, that it's very important to to have these um, uh, how do you say that senses. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, guys, we have uh, one last question here for you. Then um, I says it's for uh, for any panelist who wants to answer. But how can mindfulness practice help players provide data like RPE or daily well-being? Chris, I'll let you take it because then I'm probably going to give a completely different answer. Well, then it's going to be nice to have two different answers. Um, I think I already already told about I already talked about that in my presentation. Um, uh, how mindfulness can change RPE. Uh, for example, uh, the fatigue F, the fatigue score after a, a lost game, or I think if the, the physical side of the game uh, and would be physical stress would be the same after a win or loss game, you could you would get different RPEs. Um, and that has also something to do with the mindfulness. What is your uh, what is the energy in your body? Did you do you feel positive? If you feel positive, you would probably recover better. And the game wasn't that hard, although you did a very hard job. And the same uh, accounts for the, the next morning. So I think if you are able to get your, your body and yourself in a higher state of energy, in a more positive flow, it will definitely affect your RPE scores in a way that you can um, do more, that you can do more. And if you, uh, the fatigue scores will get, um, will get different. Let me say this, I think the, um, a hard training, the eight that you would normally give is a different eight 
for when you're feeling uh, very good because you have the feeling that you would were, were able to do more. And the fatigue score for, uh, for example, an aid, it was very, very hard, would be different if you are feeling uh, depressed or you're feeling happy with that aid. So it is something to do with your states, but I think it is a different kind of aid. So it is not like, oh, it's definitely a significant difference between them. I think the same number would give a different um, feeling with it. Okay. So mine is kind of, I don't really like RPEs. I think you have to do a really good job as a coach. And I think it needs to be explained better on most teams in order to get players to buy in because half the time they're lying or they're not lying. They just don't really care. So they're giving the same answers most of the time, or they're listening to what their teammates said. And they're giving a range, either one higher or one lower, just depending on how they personally feel. If you overhear your teammates say that practice was only a six and you're really tired and you want to say eight, you're probably only going to give a seven because you don't want them to think you're weak or something like that. A lot of players on RP2, they they don't know where the information's going, so they'll be afraid to tell you that they're really tired, thinking they won't play in the next game or, or things like that. So I think a lot of staff needs to do a much better job of explaining where the data is going, why it's going there, and why it's important for the players. Um, so I guess this comes into mindfulness of getting your players to buy into a common thread and a common thing. And I don't think enough clubs really explain where the RP is going and what it's doing and giving their players peace of mind. For some players, I think it's really stressful. Um, there's also like the morning check-ins that are kind of data that most clubs do now where you talk about how you sleep, if you didn't, if you're stressed, blah, blah, blah. A lot of players just lie. I know for a fact they do because <laughs> I can talk to my teammate and they'll tell me they're super stressed. They didn't sleep, blah, blah, blah. But then I'll see their, like I'll find out from the coach of what they wrote and they wrote, slept fine, I'm okay, blah, blah, blah. So I think it's really difficult to get your players to actually give you true numbers, especially if they don't know where the numbers are going. I think, I think this is, um, we talked about uh, integrating mindfulness in the academies. And I think that um, RPE scores, but also, but also data of GPS, for example, and heart rate, it's all these data, if we, uh, let players know what we do with them, what we do with it, and um, what it brings the player to be honest about them, and let the players feel and know that these numbers, these RPE numbers, and these GPS data, and all the other things we are monitoring and measuring, that it is not about um, uh, it's not about hurting them; it's about helping them. It is about players in a very, very stressful environment. We're asking a lot of them. They train hard, they have these matches, they have a lot of stress. And why do we want to use these numbers? Because we want also create, we also want to create a high comfort culture. We want to comfort them, we want to help them. We want to know how they're feeling so we can adjust the training. And we want to adjust the training because we want that player to be able to play the next match. It is not about um, monitoring and then, hey, you cannot play this match. No, it's about always you want to play the match and we want to help the player to cope in this, um, in this high performance culture. And I agree, Ariana. I totally agree that if the feeling is there that it doesn't help you and that you are like, how did I sleep? Oh, I slept shit, but oh, I'm just going to put in this three. Well, of course, there, there will be some... Um, uh, some lying, but if people, if the players are, um, uh, how do you say it, over the years by 15, 16, 17, 18 years old, and they've seen, and they have the, tr they have seen that it worked for them, that the numbers work for them, and that the staff is helping them with it, it is totally different. But it is so, so important that that happens. Otherwise, it can feel like this, this, uh, this blade that is just like hanging over your head, like if you have slept wrong. Tch there goes your head or you cannot play. And that is something that's definitely not where they're for. But I think it, it's not just buying in from a young age because once you change clubs, you could still have a fear that that club is different the way they look at it. Oh, so I, agree. Really I agree, I agree. And I also think I'm really interested just to ask you personally, if I went to your players right now and asked them if they feel, I can't remember all your your adjectives that you used, if they feel comforted by the club and these things, do you think they would say yes? Or do you guys assume that? Like, have you actually explained RPE to them? 
Oh yeah, yeah. Explain RP and what it what it does, and and also um, if a player f fills in, if if I had the um, uh, if I got the results of the morning, how they feel, muscle soreness, etc. I would go in and 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 ask like, hey, um, have this personal conversation. Like, hey, can I help you with this with this muscle soreness? What can we do to make it better so you can have a better training? So it's about helping the players, and if they have. It's not about only getting that I've said that this is the case. If players see that I'm helping them because of those numbers, and if they feel that they are helped by giving those numbers, then something changes. And I agree. If you go to a different club, it might not uh, it might not help. And it and it's also as a strength and conditioning coach, you can have this attitude. And then if a head coach just uh, get down with this sort to a player like um, or wants to say something but hey your your RPE was too high so uh, you're not fit today just that little quote can just break down this whole uh, basis of trust so then, then you, as a player you're like okay I thought I was helped but now the trainer said that uh, I'm not fit because of one number okay there we go so I agree Ariana it is uh, it, it is a lot of trust there And yes, you can you can get a you can do an interview. That would be great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Sort of then with the final one, sort of Ariana. Then as a as a player, have you have you brought into this, or are you still prone to maybe upping a number, lowering a number from from time to time? And, Honestly. And and, and um, but but but, but the main question that was just yeah just messing. But the main question is. Does your use of mindfulness enable you when you're giving these answers to these questions, you feel you're able to give more clearer question answers, clearer answers to those questions. Whereas you say some of your colleagues may be picking numbers based on what other colleagues say because they really aren't 100% sure of how they feel all the time. So I think I'm the worst person to be an example for this. One, I'm married to a uh, strength and conditioning prep for a high level team. Um, so I know what he goes through and what he uses his numbers for and stuff. So I hear about it all the time and I understand what the numbers are. Um, and I know the training level and, and what he does with his, his male players and stuff. So it's a little different for me. And plus two, I'm at the end of my career. I'm not really afraid of repercussions of what number I put or not. And I'm old. So if I am really tired, I might need not to do a second training because something might break. Uh, so I'm like literally the worst person to give this to because I'm going to answer what I need and, and it's not going to have an effect on me. I'm not scared of the repercussions. I'm not scared of being benched the next game. I'm not scared of sitting out of training because I am tired and that's what my body needs. Where with younger generations or players that are on the cusp of whether they're going to play or not in the next game, I can see where their hesitance comes from and I can see why they might be scared. And I know other players, they just don't care. Like, whatever, check, check. It's something they don't want to do in the morning. There's a lot of players that are, our data analyst has to be on them, that they don't respond regularly even when they're supposed to. Um, so, yeah, I think, again, I'm just the worst person to ask this to because I'm not the average mean of what players are doing or not doing still a very good answer though mm. yeah so yeah thanks ariana for, for that and also uh, uh for you for you chris i think that's uh, a good uh, a good point to wrap it up on today thank you for, thank you very much do, do you want me to answer that then no right we're good right if you want to if you've got an answer to that no no, you don't. <laughs> no, you don't. Or no, you won't. <laughs> well, maybe the last thing I want to I want to add to this is that um, I, I see in a lot of professional clubs at the moment that, that that there are that there is so much stuff around players that if those kind of numbers go to a data analyst, for example, and um, it goes somewhere and they don't get the feedback or they don't see. Um, uh, that it that is really working for them. So that's what I meant. Like when I see the numbers in the morning, I get it from my uh, data analyst, and 
I would go with those numbers and check, see, like see some, some, some flags. I call it flags, like yellow flags. Like, okay, I got to talk to this player. I got to talk to this. Okay, this is interesting. And I would go into the gym pre-training pre, and I would just uh, uh, talk and like, hey, can I help? And if, if players see this, uh, this circle, this feedback circle, this feedback loop of the person that is helping them, is training them and that the numbers that they give is coming back through that person, then, and then it's a total different story. But still, it is, a, uh, it is all about uh, uh, building trust with that instead of that it is something that uh, you can hit someone with. 100%, Chris. I think that's a really important part and for anybody watching now or that will watch later. It's really, we have so much data and there's so many different things you can buy and you can hook us up to heart monitors, GPS. Uh, I have something I sleep with. Um, there's so much data going out there, but at the end of the day, we're just humans and we just have emotion that can't be calculated and, and can't be analyzed. And it's really important to keep that human interaction and that human touch to the data can only show you so much and you need the human interaction in order to actually help your players.